The headline, security operatives engage suspected terrorists in gun battle in Mina. Parliamentary Workers Association threatened to short down state assembly over autonomy. Price of locally produced rice drops in Taraba State. And from the international scene, Israel increases strikes on Gaza as two more hostages freed. Hello and welcome to Trust TV News Update. I am Sumaya Abubakar. Thank you for joining us and now the details. We start with security. Now, there was a pandemonium at Beganu area of Mina, Niger State capital, on Tuesday morning when a suspected member of Boko Haram and kidnapper reportedly engaged security operatives in a gun duel for several hours. Security operatives were said to have launched search and operations around a building belonging to the suspect at Beganu area of Mina after intelligence of his involvement in terrorism activities in the state. 150 AK-47 rifles, about 3,000 live ammunition, explosives, a rocket launcher, an anti-aircraft rifle were recovered from the house. A night watchman at the neighboring house, Mubarak Abubakar, was reportedly hit by a stray bullet and was rushed to the emergency unit of the IBB Specialist Hospital, Mina, where he is responding to treatment. The residents said that the operation, which started started around 12 a.m. lasted for hours as the suspect engaged security operatives in fierce gun duel before he eventually escaped, putting them in more fears. Now, for more updates, we will be joined by Abubakar Akote via the phone, our Niger State reporter, to tell us more details on what is happening. So, Abubakar, thank you so much for joining us. Tell us the situation in Beganu area of Mina. What is happening? Uh, right now, I'm still at the, at the scene of the incident. Uh, according to residents, uh, last night was uh, very fearful to them. Uh, many of them uh, said they could not sleep uh, throughout the night uh, until this morning. Uh, it was around 12 uh, a.m. in the night that they, they started uh, hearing gunshots. Although some claimed that uh, they had noticed, uh, they noticed some movement of uh, individuals uh, who could be uh, secret police uh, in the afternoon and evening uh, parading the area, maybe trying to take note of the, the exact how the suspect was uh, living in. And then uh, towards the evening, they also noticed uh, uh, that uh, drones were deployed in the area uh, on surveillance, uh, but did not actually uh, occur to them uh, what was actually happening. They thought it was a normal uh, thing that happened so until when the the, uh, the operation was launched. However, when the, according to them, a security source uh, told me that uh, when security operatives arrived in the area to carry out the operation, uh, they, they, their movement was noticed by the suspect uh, uh, with a uh, uh, CCTV camera in Solin's house, uh, which they, la they later discovered when they got entrance. So he was forced to to start firing, and then the security operator responded uh, for hours, uh, but he was eventually able to bring that part of the fence of his uh, house to, uh, they said, to a rocket uh, launcher and the two which he escaped. However, his wife and children were were uh, apprehended. Uh, they said that he moved into the building less than two years ago, uh, which he bought, a computer building which he bought, and since he, uh, he arrived in the area, uh, nobody, he, he did not allow his wife to, to mingle with people in the area. Uh, his wife is always in the car, and then children, except children who go to a nearby Islamia, and uh, he's not always uh, outside too. Uh, so the people did not know much uh, about him until uh, yesterday. However, during the operation, the nearby uh, uh, house, a uh, sense of the nearby house was also brought down by uh, what people suspected to be explosive because uh, a part of the fence and they also entered a, a, a pallo of the neighboring house was brought down uh, aside his own fence that uh, was brought down through which uh, he escaped. So uh, what are the security uh, operatives saying at the moment, you know, concerning his escape? 
Uh, right now, security operatives have not responded to my inquiry so far. Uh, because I even arrived there this morning around 10 to 11, uh, police were still on ground. Uh, though I took permission from them to be able to, to, to survey the, the building, uh, with the grant, but none of them, uh, who speak to me except those who told me things on on on, uh, uh, on condition of anonymity, and also I tried to contact the police bureau, but he has not responded yet. Uh, but I will, uh, for now, there is no official uh, statement from either the government or the the security operatives uh, as regard to the operation. All right. Thank you so much, Abu Bakar Akuti, for your time. We hope that, of course, yes, that the security yes. operatives get to get hold of this particular person. I mean, it's a really progress, uh, progressive, you know, uh, state for the Niger state um, operatives. Thank you so much for joining us. Right away from that, now the National Assembly workers and that of the 36 state houses of assembly have threatened to shut down the parliament until their demand on autonomy for the legislative arm of the government is granted. The workers under the auspices of Parliamentary Staff Association of Nigeria, PASEN, are demanding that state governors should commence immediate implementation of financial autonomy for the state assemblies in line with the 1999 constitution in separate letters sent to the chairman nigerian governors forum chairman forum of speakers and the department of state services the dss the workers explained that they had earlier issued a 21 day strike notice the letters signed by acting secretary general of person agugbe Ugochi Happiness argued that their decision to short down legislative arms of government became imperative due to the governor's failure to implement the financial autonomy as provided in the constitution. After submitting the letters, Happiness also told journalists that they had, since September 18th this year, issued the ultimatum and the governors ignored the ultimatum till it expired. It will be recalled that parliamentary workers had on several occasions embarked on a series of street protests to press home their demands. President Bola Ahmed Tunubu has promised the Nigerian business community that crucial plans have been put in place to improve foreign exchange liquidity. He spoke on Monday at the opening of the 29th Nigerian Economic Summit, the NES, in Abuja, stressing that his administration would honor every legitimate contract with respect to the nation's foreign exchange obligations. Kende Amodu reports. President Tinubu at the Nigerian Economic Summit is the rubbin of like minds. The two parties here are speaking the same language. So it must be reassuring to the captains of industry gathered to hear the president say that government is not blind to the challenges being faced in the financial markets. I can only allay these concerns by revealing that we have a good line of, of sight for the additional foreign exchange liquidity that is required to restore market confidence. And we are going to do that. President Inumbu is confident that by working with the private sector, financing the $3 trillion national infrastructure stock can be achieved in 10 years and not in 300 years, while the construction of mega cities in every geopolitical zone of the size and scale of Lagos can be achieved in one decade. A one trillion dollar economy is possible by year 2026. And a three trillion dollar economy is also possible within this decade. Also speaking on the side of government, Minister of Budget and National Planning is harping on better cooperation between government and the private sector, especially in the evolution of development plans. We are a nation where in every financial year at least 800 public budgets have been 734 in different local governments, 36 budgets in the states and IFCT uh, as well as the federal government. So there is an irreducible minimum of policy linkage and coordination that is required in order for this to deliver the promises that Nigeria uh, has 
Nigeria's foremost private sector think tank and policy advocacy group is stressing the need for the transformation of the country's economy into one that is competitive, inclusive and open, which will only be possible if leaders in both public and private sectors work together to achieve identified national values. The first step to take is to tackle the present challenges which may cripple the economy if not addressed. The low access to and the increasing cost of FXC, the high cost of inventory, of imported inputs and operations, coupled with the diversity of taxes, continue to erode business balance sheets with resultant contraction in production and in employment. Government has introduced several measures to resuscitate the economy, including the 500 billion naira intervention to support small businesses and the agricultural sector. By January 2024, the new student loan program and consumer credit schemes will have come into effect. The question is, will these interventions go far enough? From the federal capital, Kendi Amudu, Trust TV News. The federal government has received 108 Nigerian migrants stranded in Niger Republic. This is contained in a statement by the Southwest Zonal Coordinator, National Commission for Refugees, Migrants and Internally Displaced Persons, Alexander Oturu, on Tuesday in Abuja. The commission said the Nigerians include 32 males, 29 females, 44 children and 3 infants. The migration were conveyed to the Lagos State Emergency Management Agency camp where the NCFRMI, an international organization for migration, have a tripartite agreement to provide temporary shelter for the returnees before they are provided with onward transportation allowance to enable them to get to their final destination. The returnees, he said, was facilitated by the Nigerian mission in Niamey and the IOM. In line with President Tinubu's renewed hope agenda, the returnees will be integrated into various government programs, as well as the reintegration programs of the UN Migration Agency. The management, staff and other stakeholders at the Sam Mbakwe International Cargo Airport Uweri have assured the public and users of the airport of the commitment and readiness to manage any emergency situation. The airport manager, Rejoice Ndu Dinachi, stated this while addressing newsmen shortly after the mock exercise on emergency management held at the airport. Trust TV's Ajibadi Praise was there and now reports. The Sam Mbakwe International Cargo Airport is one of the busiest airports in eastern Nigeria with both domestic and international flight operations. Considering its busy nature, the need for maximum and up-to-date safety architecture in a case of any eventualities cannot be overemphasized. The airport manager said the recent mock exercise of an emergency conducted shows that they are competent in that regard. She speaks on the response of the medical team, firefighters, police, air force and other stakeholders in the emergency management plan. Uh, it's our normal uh, program, it's a mock exercise. We just want to test uh, our preparedness when there's an uh, emergency. It's just a mock exercise. And uh, we are telling everybody that it's safe to travel from here. And we pray there will be no emergency. To test the readiness of personnel to respond to emergency, management had staged an emergency situation where the T-smock was sighted around the airport with a danger alarm alert. Within few minutes, all respondents had arrived the scene to arrest the situation. It turned out for many who rushed to the scene, that it was a mock exercise which management embarked on to test everyone's level of preparedness. The response was okay. We have reviewed the response time and uh, everything, assisting agencies, our resources, we reviewed everything. And uh, we, from the assessment, I think uh, we did well. Though the mock exercise recorded huge success following the prompt response, the stakeholders further interacted to identify possible lapses with a view to correct them. Ajiba de Praise, Trust TV News, Oweri. Price of locally processed rice has dropped in Taraba State. 
Finance showed that a measure of local rice sold a few weeks ago at 1,700 naira is now sold at the rate of 800 naira and 1,100 naira. Areas where price of local price dropped include the Kunini, Mutumdaya, Gamfetu, Lau, Garbachede and Kungana. Similarly, the price of paddy rice has also come down across the state. Daily Trust findings showed that 100 kg bag of paddy rice sold previously at 37,000 naira has dropped to between 19,000 naira and 22,000 naira. Rice is cheaper in remote parts of the state than in grain markets located along major roads, the finding further reveals. Now, farmers interviewed attributed the drop in the price of local rice to bumper harvest witnessed by rice farmers, an absence of middlemen that buy paddy directly from farmers and process it. Yakuku Adamu said that previously middlemen followed farmers to their farms to buy paddy rice during harvest. He, however, said there are no middlemen this term that usually follow farmers to their farms to buy the paddy rice. You're watching news update on Trust TV. Coming up. We'll take a look at the family of Faiz Abdullahi demand justice. This and more after the break. Stay with us. It was never a consensus. We did all our best. You see, in politics, you give your contribution to the best of your ability. If you want, I forward to you this statement. You go to this bank and verify. Do. I'm but coming. there are people who I'm say coming. not spending money is not a bad thing. I'm coming. Itself. Let me finish. Because there's so much to be done. Let me finish. Now, you don't allow me to explain myself. The recent development shows abductions are now a factor of informants embedded in communities. It's not about the people of Katana to say that, no, during my administration, I was able to stop insecurity. No. It's about collective responsibility for all of us. And what we should ask ourselves is not what has been seen, is the life better? Are there more people who are unemployed, who are not become employed? Is the level of corruption has gone down? Is there inclusion? All those issues. We're, we're actually a gas country with associated oil. Our focus has always been on oil, that we have never paid attention, significant attention to, to gas. To do it effectively, we need to have honest conversation with ourselves. Government needs to come down from its high horse and communicate with the people and be trust. There must be a solution. We cannot continue this way. They must come back to the table and agree. So who shall we do my education? All these children that you know sit for them, they want to go to higher education. But the other but I mean just a short while ago you were saying that why bring ten children mm -hmm. where you cannot cater for them? So why bring more universities where you cannot cater for the education? Welcome back. If you're just joining us, this is News Update on Trust TV. Here's a recap of our top stories. We brought you security operatives engage suspected terrorists in gun battle in MENA. And Parliamentary Workers Association threatened to short down state assembly over autonomy. Moving on to more stories, the Chief Magistrate Court 3 sitting in Katsina has ordered the police to produce Batagarawa Local Council Chairman Balagar Batsani before the court on Thursday, November 27th over alleged murder. The presiding magistrate, Abdul Karim Umar, gave the order during the court sitting in Katsina. The council chairman and 11 others were brought before the court over alleged mother of village head of Dabaibayawa Diko Ahmed recently. The accused were charged before the court for alleged criminal conspiracy, kidnapping, abduction and mother of the village head. The accused were charged under section 59, 249 and 189 of the Katsina Penal Court Law. The 11 accused persons were in court except the local council chairman prompting the magistrate to order police to produce him on the next adjourned date. 
The family of Faiz Abdullahi, who was allegedly tortured to death while in custody of police in Kao, Kaduna, is still demanding justice over the death of their child. The mother of the victim said that months after the incident, the family is still devastated due to shock and trauma. Trust TV's Bello Musa visited the residence of the deceased at Goberawa community of Hayambanki, Kaduna, and sent in this report. This has been her reaction for months whenever she remembers her son Faiz Abdullahi, who was allegedly tortured to death while in police custody in Kaduna. His death is still fresh in my mind. I am traumatized and unable to sleep because I am still living in pain. Justice for her son Faiz Abdullahi is what she is demanding, saying the authorities concerned have to do something to ensure that justice is served. I am appealing to the government as my last hope to help and ensure justice is served in the death of my son. Despite the frustration the family is facing while pursuing the case for months, Fai's brother say quitting is not an option. <laughs> We are beginning to lose hope because we don't know if the police can fish out the suspects and ensure that they are punished. We even went to Abuja and yet nothing has been done. We will not relent because we are still pushing for justice for our brother and we want the authorities concerned to ensure justice is served. Mukhtar Muhammad is a human rights activist. He says, despite the petition by the family regarding Fai's death, they are yet to get tangible feedback from the police in Kaduna. Uh, we used to visit the, the police headquarters in order to ascertain the, 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 the cause of the investigation by the police. So, uh, as I'm telling you, uh, we didn't get the fact from then, so that uh, led us to write another petition to Inspector General of Police in either to transfer the case from Kaduna Command to, to Abuja to make sure that justice is served. The Public Relations Officer of the Kaduna State Police Command, ASP Mansur Hassan, while reacting via phone said a committee has been set up to investigate the matter, adding that the affected DPO has been suspended while investigation is still ongoing. Ben Musa, Trust TV News Kaduna. From the international scene, Israel escalated its bombardment of targets in the Gaza Strip on Tuesday, ahead of an expected ground invasion against Hamas militants that the U.S. fears could spark a wider conflict in the region, including attacks on American troops. The stepped up attacks and the rapidly rising death toll in Gaza came as Hamas released two elderly Israeli women who were among the hundreds of hostages it captured during its devastating October 7th attack on towns in southern Israel. The two freed hostages, 85-year-old Yujev Lifshitz and 79-year-old Nurit Cooper, were taken out of Gaza at the Rafah crossing into Egypt, where they were put into ambulances, according to footage shown on Egyptian TV. The women, along with their husbands, were snatched from their homes in the kibbutz of Nir Oz, near the Gaza border. Their husbands, age, ages 83 and 84, were not released. Amid a flurry of diplomatic activity in Israel since the war started, French President Emmanuel Macron arrived in Tel Aviv on Tuesday, meeting with the families of others held hostages in Gaza, in Gaza before heading to talk with the top Israeli officials. Meanwhile, the Ministry of Health in the Gaza Strip has warned that the electric generators in hospitals will cease functioning within the next 48 hours due to the fuel shortage amid intensified air raids by Israel on the besieged enclave. The ministry spokesperson Ashraf al qudra said in a brief statement on Telegram early on Tuesday that the flow of humanitarian aid into Gaza is slow and cannot change the reality on the ground.
The Indonesian hospital in northern Gaza's Beit Lahia area was shut down as it could not carry out vital facilities after running out of power on Monday. Meanwhile, a convoy of humanitarian aid trucks delivered water, food and medicine to the Gaza Strip on Monday. The third since limited aid began flowing in on Saturday. The UN says fuel was not included and reserves will run out within two days. In sports, the midfielder S. Tha Onyene Zide, who impressed at last year's FIFA Under-20 Women's World Cup final in Costa Rica as Nigeria reached the quarterfinals, has been drafted to take the place of 2023 FIFA World Cup star Halimatu Ayinde in Nigeria's squad for the 2024 Women Olympic Football Tournament fixture against Ethiopia's senior national team. The delegation of home-based players, technical and backroom staff from Nigeria flew into Addis Ababa on Sunday for Wednesday's opening leg encounter at the Abebe Bekila Stadium. The foreign-based players have started arriving for the big match as well. The Super Falcons will host the second leg of the second round fixture at the MKO Abiola Stadium Abuja on October 31st, 2023. Midfielder Regina Otu, who missed the FIFA Women's World Cup finals in Australia and New Zealand in the summer, and defender Osinachi Ohale, who plays for Pachuca FC of Mexico, have been ruled out of the fixture. Christine Ucheibe of Portuguese club SL Benfica is also out of the encounter. The winner of the aggregate will confront the winner of the fixture between Cameroon and Uganda. The indomitable lionesses drew a bye while Uganda overpowered Rwanda 4-3 on aggregate. And with that, we wrap up news updates on Trust TV. Do not forget to follow us across all our social media platforms and join our YouTube live stream for more news programs and documentaries. I am Sumaya Abubakar. Thanks for watching.